attending. Um, I'm Gina Brewer, co-chair of the Political Action Committee, and I'll be the moderator tonight. I'd like to introduce the other members of our Political Action Committee. Ed Boris is also co-chair. Tammy Ho. Greg Brockbank. Jason uh, Cunningham. There she is, okay. And uh, Michelle Barney. Wandering around. Okay. Um, what I want to do first of all is um, discuss a little bit about the history of Marin Women's Political Action Committee because some of you don't know anything about our organization. And uh, I want you to know certain things. Um, we were part of the National Women's Political Caucus, the Marin chapter, until two years ago when the national and state NWPC decided that it was not allowed to be able to refer, to refer, to uh, recommend male candidates. We've been using the term recommend in races where there was no viable female candidate and we wanted to recommend a male. Or if there was a race where there were perhaps three open seats and only two women candidates. Uh, it's a matter of semantics, using the word recommend. They were no longer going to allow us to do that, so we pulled out of the organization and started our own. So Andy, have you got a seat yet? Well, what we thought was Whatever you want to do. Andy? We've got eight candidates and only seven, seven seats. seats. Sorry, I apologize for this delay. Jesus. Okay, so that's that's the story. We it was really important for us to be able to include men in the um, endorsement process, so we um, pulled out of NWPC. So, can someone get Andy a chair? Yeah, that's what I thought you preferred. Okay. So, uh, a few facts. There are only 89 female members of Congress. That's both houses. That's only 16.6 percent. There's 17 female senators and 71 female representatives. Our mission is to get women elected to office. But that doesn't mean we don't like men, as you can tell. Okay, so, um, as you know, this is a pretty important race. I think it's one of the most important races we've ever covered. Not only are there the incredible issues dealing with national economy and defense, but as you all know, women's health is being jeopardized in many ways. We want someone in Congress who can hit the ground running and stand up for our rights so we don't feel we have to constantly petition our congressperson, but know that person has our back and will vote uh, to benefit women. Our format for this evening will be one in which each candidate will have two minutes to give an opening statement followed by questions um, from the audience and from our political action committee members panel. Eleanor Kellogg-Smith will be our timekeeper for the evening. It's Eleanor. Yay. And um, so if you want to ask the candidate a question, please fill out one of the index cards that Greg is going, going to be handing out and, um, and uh, Gation, if you want to also, you know, you can also give them to Gation back there when you filled out your card. Um, the PAC will try to address as many questions as possible, but as you know, it's a full, it's a full program tonight. We don't want to keep you here until midnight. Uh, at the end of the forum, MWPAC members will conduct a caucus. This is open to members only, so non-members and candidates will be asked to step outside until the caucus has been completed. Members will then vote, and we will count the ballots and announce the results of the vote. Uh, for members who must leave uh, before we caucus and candidates who are, who are members, please turn in your ballots at the door as you leave. If you'd like to vote for no endorsement or no recommendation, you can. 
and your but your vote will be counted in the overall tally. Just, uh, or you can abstain, which means that if you like, you didn't vote. Um, we recommend everybody stay as long as you can to hear all the candidates speak. Um, and please give the candidates your fullest consideration. So again, thank you everybody for being here and let's get started. Okay, we're gonna work uh, left to right and each question will be, we'll move down one. So Norman, two minutes. Thank you so much. Look at Eleanor, because you got that bright light over there. Yeah. <laughs> Thanks so much. Thanks to uh, the American Women's Political Action Committee for hosting this event. When I consider what we face today, our problems are anything but moderate, from the global climate change to the fact that in our communities we have schools with too few teachers, with students suffering the consequences. I've gone to senior centers up and down the district where I've been asked to go to Washington and make sure the senior center doesn't close. We have across uh, this district and the country uh, problems with health care, education, housing, the richest country in the world. We've got Wall Street that continues to dominate the decision making in Washington and Main Street suffering. There are a lot of uh, problems we face and there are um, a lot of myths that I think we need to challenge. And one is that the solutions will come from on high. Uh, democracy needs to be activated from the grassroots. And I want to challenge head on this sort of myth uh, that the only way we get leadership is from elected officials. The best elected officials, I believe, understand that everything we have to be proud of in this country has come from social movements, whether during the New Deal or the 1960s or today. Uh, all those who empty the bedpans, who do volunteer work, who picket, who organize, who demonstrate, who do research, who do the thousands and one different things that we know happen in our own communities, that's part of leadership. My background for 40 years is engaged with writing, organizing, speaking, galvanizing change. And during the course of the evening, I look forward to uh, sharing my perspectives with you. Good evening. Uh, thanks for attending. Thanks for attending this evening. Um, the number one cause of death in women is heart disease. Number two is cancer. Uh, high up on the list are diabetes and Alzheimer's. The, uh, the cost of those four equals the military budget um, of over $600 billion. And this is the National Defense Authorization Act that details that $600 billion worth of spending. Um, for those of you who don't know, um, I'm a cannabis physician and I'm trying to work with the federal government who has intellectual property in the area of cannabis. And recent research has shown that you can reduce the size of a heart attack by 66% if you're using uh, some of the non-psychoactive cannabinoids. You can reduce insulin-dependent diabetes in a genetically driven model by 58. My youngest uh, patient, four-year-old, was sent home on morphine from Children's Hospital to die of a brain tumor after 39 hours of brain surgery, chemotherapy, and radiation. She just passed her two-year anniversary um, and has complete resolution of all the scar tissue, uh, despite the fact that um, they thought that she would have been dead in 10 to 14 days. A group of kids in the Bay Area that have Dervais, a seizure disorder from infancy where they seize 17 times a day with the uh, grand mall type seizures and hundreds of the petty malls. And the same, the same molecule patented by the federal government um, used is providing them with multiple days of relief. So while cannabis may seem, you know, uh, I've been labeled a single topic person, it actually brings tremendous benefit um, this area is known the world over. I'm the world's expert in non-psychoactive use of this plant. That in addition to my commitment to the environment, uh, to jobs, to the use of the uh, ocean resource, to protect it from oil, as well as to allow it to provide energy, um, are some of my many interests. Term limits um, seem essential if we're going to change the nature of Congress. And as a psychiatrist, I'm skilled in conflict resolution, which obviously could be of great benefit as well. Okay, that was Dr. Courtney. and. and want everybody to introduce themselves. And this, of course, is Norman Solomon. Okay, Jared. Good evening. I'm Jared Huffman, and I want to thank the Marin Women's Political Action Committee for having this forum. 
I'm sorry that uh, I'm not able to seek or receive your endorsement tonight, but I respect the rules, I respect the process, and the truth is, making my case, uh, even with those rules for uh, women's support, is very important to me. Because women's rights and equality are core values of mine, and you don't have to just accept that as something that I started saying on the campaign trail. Uh, you can actually look back at the course of my career and see that it's a core value. I started uh, as a young civil rights attorney out of law school representing women and women's organizations in civil rights cases, gender discrimination cases involving the workplace, the Equal Pay Act, representing California now under Title IX in a major piece of litigation against the entire Cal State University system where we brought 23 campuses of that system into compliance with the gender equity laws. We literally created thousands of athletic opportunities for female scholar athletes, and I'm very, very proud of that work. Continuing through my career on the Marin Municipal Water uh, District Board, uh, I helped uh, hire the first woman general manager ever to that district. I helped support the first African-American woman speaker to the California Assembly. Early on in her campaign, I supported Kamala Harris for attorney general over three of my male colleagues in the state assembly. That's pretty unusual. So standing up for women, supporting them when they are the most qualified candidate for office, these are core values of mine, and you need to know the core values of your next member uh, of Congress. Uh, you know mine because I've been representing you, not just on these important women's issues where I've accumulated a 100% career voting record with NOW, with NARAL, with Planned Parenthood, but on the full range of progressive democratic issues from protecting our environment to helping the disabled and fighting against some terrible uh, cuts and proposals involving public education in the midst of this awful fiscal crisis. I couple those values with a record of getting things done as a legislator, and I hope that combination of values and a legislative record uh, will earn me your support on June 5th. <laughs> Good evening, my name is Tiffany Renee, I'm Petaluma City Vice Mayor, and I am running to be the ninth Latina elected to U.S. Congress in our nation's history. I've been in uh, Sonoma County for the past 20 years. Prior to moving to Sonoma County, I did live and work in Marin County, um, lived in Tam Valley, and worked at the Grateful Dead Ticket Office, not far from here. Um, I have been working on women's rights issues in Sonoma County for the last 20 some odd years, uh, working on women's campaigns and um, really uh, featuring and, and bringing and bearing witness to violence against women uh, with a monthly vigil up in uh, Santa Rosa when I was um, at the JCF there. When I moved to Petaluma, I continued that work and um, have since uh, been elected to Petaluma City Council as the first Latina elected to the Pet Petaluma City Council. I uh, have been uh, working on transportation and environmental planning issues throughout the region, uh, both on uh, Sonoma County Transportation Authority and the um, Association of Bay Area Governments. And uh, prior to being on City Council, I was uh, Commissioner for the Commission on the Status of Women. I have a, a Bachelor's Degree in Women's Studies and a Master's Degree uh, in Philosophy and Religion with a focus on environmental um, uh, integral ecology. I'm looking forward to um, having you learn more about my campaign, and, and if you uh, care to take information as you leave here, uh, there's a list of, of uh, positions that I have, and uh, I look forward to speaking with you after as well, and, and appreciate your inviting me here tonight. Thank you. Good evening, everybody. I sort of feel like the spawning salmon has come home <laughs> because I've spent many wonderful times in this chamber on policy issues, and I have been a longtime member of this organization, so I appreciate the opportunity to be on this side of the dais again tonight for your support. I've been, many of you know, I've been on the Board of Supervisors for the last 10 years, um, fighting for some pretty tough issues uh, at our board, and I've been a member of this organization for about a dozen years. I'm a mom, I'm a grandma, I think my grandson is with his mom in the back there behaving himself, which I'm appreciative of. And I am also a women's health nurse practitioner and a, pro and, a, and a professor of nursing. And I have been on the front lines actually providing women's health reproductive uh, services as well as fighting for those. As a policymaker representing this district, I'm really proud of the record that I've had over the past.
last 10 years of delivering the goods for this community and fighting some really tough battles. Um, whether it was the building of our health and wellness campus using tobacco settlement money so that nobody in this district has to go bankrupt because they don't have a medical home. Or the Marin Energy Authority, which is creating green jobs and is going to help us get off the fossil fuel grid over the next 10 years. A media center, a public media center that's a beehive of activity. Walkable, bikeable pathways, a domestic violence court, mentally ill offenders court, a medical reserve court, building affordable housing and creating jobs. And I'm, I have a very public record about this. Um, unlike you know, some of the candidates that are here tonight, I can't fudge on the things that I've been able to do, all of my, the good, the bad, and the ugly about being in political life. And I think having a public record and being engaged in civic life in the community is really important. Um, as a longtime active member of this body, I hope that I will continue to have your support. Send a nurse to Washington to heal the house. My name is Larry Fritzlin. I'm a marriage and family therapist. I help dysfunctional systems become functional. Our current political system, both the Republicans and the Democrats, are dysfunctional. We all know this, and this is why over 90% of us distrust Washington and Congress. I'd like to say a couple of quotes, one from Bill Moyers. Our politicians are little more than money launderers in the traffic of power and policy. Leon Panetta, legalized bribery has become a part of the culture of how this place operates. Huffman, Solomon, and perhaps others have resolutely marched into that swamp. They have already taken money from PACs, unions, and the wealthiest 1%, and will be part of this dysfunction if elected. I will not take money from any source other than individual citizens, and then only $100 or less. A quote from Thoreau, there are those hacking at the branches of evil, but not the root. Of all the candidates in District 2, I believe that I am the only one striking at the root cause of the dysfunction. My positions on a range of issues are clear and laid out in my book. We are the 99% and we are running for office, Washington's worst nightmare. My goals, number one, campaign finance, get the money out of politics. Two, the environment. We need a World War II-like effort to reverse the catastrophic environmental degradation. Three, end the drug war. 45% of families are impacted by addiction, and addiction create, contributes to crime, violence against women, men, and children, racism, poverty, and massive costs to our society. You have a choice in this election. Vote for another establishment guy who say that they will hack at the branches of evil, or vote for someone who will strike at the root cause. Thank you. So welcome everyone. Thank you again to uh, Marine Women's PAC and for all of you for being here tonight. It's always a thrill and an honor to speak to you and to uh, discuss the issues that are most important on all of our minds. As a granddaughter of a mill worker and the daughter of a truck driver, uh, I've been fighting for our working and middle class families for almost all of my life. My family started with very modest means and through my dad's hard work, he built a small company and that actually helped us to move from a trailer in the woods into the middle class. So those issues around rebuilding our middle class and restoring our economy are ones that are so, so near and dear to my heart. And as I travel up and down this district, what I've been hearing from folks is working families no longer feel like they really get a fair shake. Something has changed in our economy and it feels like it's harder to get by. Those kinds of jobs that help put our kids through college and uh, create a secure retirement are, are harder to come by. And so as an educator and a small business owner, these are the issues for me around this campaign. That I'm the only candidate in the race who actually has a track record of hands-on experience in the trenches with small business, helping them create jobs, create the livelihoods that can rebuild our middle class, and creating the kinds of policy that can help restore that at a government level. So I also created the, uh, uh, co founded the Center for Entrepreneurship and Technology, where I get to teach our brightest young minds to become entrepreneurs, to create small business, and where we focus on policy as it relates to economic development, restoring our manufacturing sector, clean energy, and new sectors that can actually be the job creators of our future. That policy needs to go to Washington. We have a lot of career track politicians. 6% approval ratings, or 9%, depending on what polls you look at, 
And I think what's clear is that people are asking for domain expertise, folks that understand how to get our economy going, to step into the political arena, and to be part of creating solutions that can restore our middle class, restore our economy, and make sure that we can all send our kids to college and make sure we have a secure retirement and a safe future. Thank you. Hi, everybody. Really nice to be here. Say, is anybody here oh, distressed? Yeah, Andy, will you identify yourself? Oh, hi. I'm Andy Caffrey from Garberville, Humboldt County. Uh, I'm 54 and I've been in a grassroots organizer my whole life. And what I've tried to do is find the most effective way to make change. I've been involved in over a thousand campaigns and projects. Most recently, my video footage is used in the film Who Bombed Judy Berry, which is about two of my organizing partners who were the victims of a car bomb attack in Oakland in 1990. And the bomber still hasn't been found. So now we have this film and we're going after that bomber. Because as you all know, violence against women also manifests politically. And Judy was probably targeted for being an effective woman leader in Earth First. How many people here are freaked out by either the climate crisis, the ecological meltdown, the destruction of the economy, or the destruction of our government? Well, I start with our plight. Thank you. I start with our plight. I don't start with the status quo. What can we expect to do in Congress? I think the biggest difference between me and the other candidates is not necessarily our views on the issues. I like all of these people, and I can tell you they all are committed to doing the best they can do. What's that sign say? Okay, thank you. Um, anyway, the, I've been working on the climate crisis for 30 years, and I've been working in Earth First and helped found two green parties. And after 30 years, very little has been done. We're in a situation where we're on the verge of the ice caps breaking up and causing massive sea level increase. We're on the verge of the Amazon drying up and igniting. And we're on the verge of the methane from the oceans and the uh, tundra releasing itself. These are thresholds that I believe we absolutely cannot cross. We have to do what we have to do to prevent those things from happening. And especially if we care about our children. And I know you all do. But most people don't live their lives as if the climate crisis is real. And I'm telling you, this is no longer an issue for the future. We have to deal with it now. And the international treaties aren't going to do it. Lifestyle choices aren't going to do it. The cities and governors aren't going to do it. We're going to have to do it with the federal government. And that means electing someone like me to the Congress. Thank you. Okay. Now we're going to start asking questions. And as I said, if you have a question for one of the candidates, uh, Greg and Dacian will be looking for you to raise your hand or whatever. And uh, we'll start, um, the pa panel will start with the first question. And it'll be all the questions will be directed to all the panelists. And we'll start the first question with Norman Solomon. Yeah. How long do they have to mention? I have one minute. One minute. In order to get, unfortunately, eight candidates, all the questions in, uh, as many questions in as we can. We had to narrow it down to one minute and also be here to like alone. So sorry about that. We're used to it. Probably. <laughs> and Eleanor, as you can see, is a very good timekeeper. <laughs> Get that little whistle out. Anyway, okay. Uh, first question is 56% of all women rely on Medicare. The House introduced a budget to end Medicare as we know it. Medical costs are rising faster than the GDP. What are your proposals to keep Medicare solvent? Please address the age factor cost of living caps, vouchers, and payroll tax rates. Thank you, yeah, this, uh, this is Norman Solomon within the limits of one minute. I'd say, first of all, I took out a full page ad last summer in the Pacific Sun. It said, cutting Social Security and Medicare is not fiscal responsibility, it's betrayal. Medicare has a 3% administrative cost. The assault from the right and a lot of uh, corporate Democrats has been to imply that somehow Medicare <coughs> itself is at fault for bending the cost curve in the wrong direction. In fact, it's the hospital, pharmaceutical, and insurance industry. So I believe we've got to totally defend Medicare, defend all of the Medicare services to women and everyone, and also recognize that Medicare Part D is flawed and fix it by giving a change away from the uh, corporate America and the uh, pharmaceutical industry and giving the change to those who are on Medicare. So it's about defending Medicare, absolutely giving no ground, and recognizing that if we give ground, whether it's on women's health, reproductive rights, or any other realm, that is totally unacceptable. Let's stand our ground on Medicare. Okay. Um, 
single payer is single payer has to be a part of the equation. Um, that uh, current administration with insurance companies is 30% charge. We've reduced that to three. We can shift that 27% in the direction of services. Um, also important is that um, if, this, if the 5-4 court, which has given us the strip search, given us Citizens United, given us Bush over Gore, if they alter the Obama health care situation, um, we currently are looking at going bankrupt with Medicare by 2016. Um, the Obamacare was going to put that out to 2024, but if there is, if we, if we lose some of that support, things will change quickly. The big problem is the baby boomers are coming into entitlement this year, and for the first time, contributions will uh, not match uh, payouts. So it's going to become more and more complex. That's why I recommend that we look at uh, preventative medicine and the intellectual property and research is pretty clear that we can actually make a change that can help us offset the cost of Medicare as this uh, large boom moves forward. Thank you for the question. I uh, do not support any reduction in benefits under Medicare. Uh, in fact, I, I've been firmly, firm and clear enough on that that I've won the endorsement of the National Committee to Preserve Social Security and Medicare. I'm very proud of that endorsement. Uh, the number one thing that we can do to make Medicare uh, fiscally sound going into uh, the next generation is to get more people back in the workforce, paying into the system, younger people, immigrants, folks that are undocumented in this uh, country that need to be uh, tax-paying members of our economy instead of uh, working in the shadows. So uh, there are a lot of issues that kind of come together in answer to the question, but uh, those are some of them that I see. And then the last one is, of course, single-payer health care, which I do support. I've co-authored single-payer legislation every year uh, in the legislature. I'll just add one more thing on Medicare, though. If we want to see single-payer succeed, we have to make sure that state-run programs like Medicare and Medicaid stop jerking health care providers around with uncertain rates and continuing uh, reductions in the rates, because if private health care providers don't have confidence in government-run insurance, we're going to have trouble building the coalition that we need for single payers to succeed. As a local elected representative, I've continued to see health care costs rise at the local level and impact our our local budgets um, as our employees are um, requiring health care and we have to pay for those health care costs. One of the factors that I've seen that can strengthen Medicare is to um, initiate a single payer or universal health care for all federal, state, um, public, local employees as a, um, a way to phase in uh, universal health care. You remove the cap, uh, the age cap for all of those employees and their family members and then you strengthen Medicare. Um, and the ability of those benefits uh, to pay out because you've brought so many more people into the system. In terms of um, cost of, of living and reduction of benefits, I, I certainly wouldn't support a reduction of benefits and want to continue to see Medicare increase and, and strengthen overall in time. And so by providing that um, first step through paying um, employees um, through Medicare is, is a way to do that and then utilize that money at the local level in other ways. Thank you. Thank you. Well, as a health care provider, I'm the candidate in this race who's most qualified to deal with this issue. I've served on the National Association of Counties on the Health Policy Committee, where we had a seat at the table in the national discussion on health care reform. And with less than 17% of our elected representatives being women, I think that's part of the problem in Washington right now, is that we don't have enough gender balance and we don't have enough women fighting for women's issues. I have been a single payer advocate for my whole career. I teach it in the graduate school. Um, protecting Medicare uh, is going to be one of the important priorities that, that I tackle. But it's not just Medicare for our seniors, it's Medicare for all. And if we have a larger pool, we'll be able to, um, be able to make the economics work. I think that it's not only a public health issue that we all have access to health care, but it's also a national security issue and it's an economic issue and it is directly tied to our ability to have a sustainable jobs and uh, economy. Clearly we need universal health care. That's, that's not a question. 
It's not going to happen the way things are set up now. Right now, we have in, in Washington big, big uh, health care, big lawyers, big corporations, big unions buying off politicians. And we're stuck in this polarized situation where nobody's moving. It's just not moving. The core <laughs> issue here in order to get to uh, universal health care is to get the money out of politics, get the politicians that are taking the money out of Washington. Um, we have a situation where General Electric can make $4.6 billion last year and not pay anything in taxes. And I'm a, I'm a, a health care provider to a mental health care provider. And for almost 20 years, I've been working with, with, uh, with people that are not able to afford mental health. And this ends up costing us much, much more than it would be if we could just get to the root causes and be able to provide universal health care, including mental health care, for everybody. Thank you. We are one of the only developed countries that doesn't ensure universal health care for all of our citizens. And I believe this should be part of our social contract. As the granddaughter of a nurse and uh, the daughter of a mom who runs the, the state uh, public health workers, uh, health care has been something that's near and dear to my heart and to my family for a very long time. I think we need to strengthen Medicare, not undermine it. Uh, the Affordable Care Act was a step in the right direction to more universal care. Uh, to ensuring more Americans who've been uncovered and, and to relieve some of the most egregious um, issues that the insurance companies have um, lobbied on the American people. But really we have an insurance system that actually is incented to give less care for higher cost. And in order for us to address that issue, we need to move to single-payer health care. We need to make sure that all of our citizens are covered and that we have a program that um, ensures affordable, high-quality, accessible care for everyone. One of the reasons that Emily's List has endorsed my campaign is because I've been fighting for those issues for women in particular for a very long time. And um, thank you very much. One of the things I'd like to do in Congress, inspired by Michael Morsico, is create a department of the world's best ideas. When you look at medical care, as he showed it in that film, there were a lot of great ideas, and I don't see why we can't go that way. And we have to go that way now. We are in a time of crisis. We are on the Titanic, literally. And if people are going to try to heal Congress while the Titanic's going down, or work on some kind of Medicare salvation and not go for a lot more, it's all over. So we have to deal with the climate crisis, and I'm glad Larry's joining me in calling for a war effort to convert from fossil fuels and nuclear as fast as possible. And to do that, we have to have a social safety net that is stronger than we've ever had before, which, as all of us agree is Medicare for all. Everyone has got to have health care. Everyone has got to have access to free schools. People of all ages have got to have access to education. We have to have safe communities. We don't charge for police service and fire service. We don't need to charge for health care. The rest of the world does not do that. So my program is about doing something in a new paradigm, but it's about doing it strategically, and it's about getting the American people behind such an effort. Second question will be started by Dr. McCourtney. Campaign finances has gotten out of control, especially with the acceptance of the super PACs, allowing millions of dollars from individuals to be used in campaigns. What would you do to level the playing field? Would you sponsor or support legislation to regulate campaign financing? Um, uh, thank you very much, it's uh, Dr. Courtney. Um, Recently, Obama threatened the Supreme Court about its activism and threatened activism. The same activism, 5-4, uh, no more, has provided us with a Thornton case, which they turned over uh, the laws that in 20, 23 states where they did not want career politicians. Uh, they provided us with Bush, uh, when Gore probably could have led the charge with some attention to the environment. And in Citizens United, they delivered, once again, in this 5-4 capacity. Um, to have international corporations being able to round out the oil consortium that pretty much runs the government, the executive branch, and the planet um, will require change. And part of it, I think, is we need term limits not only for congressmen, but we need them for the Supreme Court because they need to be elected officials held accountable. And after a certain number of um, decisions like we've been facing, uh, there has to be a time when we can impeach them. 
The short answer to your question is I support overturning Citizens United. And there's two ways to do that. You can do it with a new Supreme Court. That's going to take some time and some fortuitous changes with the right justices, which doesn't always fall out the way we would like. In fact, uh, the five side of that five to four appears to have a little more longevity on the court in the years ahead, just if you look at their ages, than the four side. So we're going we're to need to work on that front. But while we do it, we need to get started on a constitutional amendment to get rid of this uh, idea of corporate personhood that allows unlimited spending. Uh, in campaigns. Uh, it distorts our democracy and it has to stop. Uh, the other thing that uh, I am doing right now and will continue to do is fighting for maximum disclosure. Uh, I'm a co-author of the Disclose Act here in California. It's a state corollary of legislation that's been proposed federally. So until we get that constitutional amendment and the real reform that we all want, we've got to make sure that we know exactly who is behind these super PACs and provide that transparency and we'll fight to do that. Thank you. Great question. I uh, was um, at the forefront of moving to uh, have a resolution in support of an amendment to end corporate personhood. Uh, the city of Petaluma passed that resolution. It was one of the first in the state. I am um, um, totally disheartened with the whole process of campaign financing um, in this congressional race. Uh, I had consultants that said, you know, 30 to 40 hours a week on the phone dialing for dollars and this is what you'll do when you go to DC. And I said no. Um, I downsized my campaign and um, I'm trying to shift that paradigm completely. We need to both run um, with integrity and change that system completely. So I support public financing of congressional races and, and if we're going to be able to go to Washington DC and not have that baggage, um, we've got to be able to get there um, without taking that kind of money in the first place. So I'm um, running a very uh, right-sized campaign and um, running it as if it were publicly financed and, um, and doing it very well. Thank you. Thank you. Well, if you look at the way the media even reports who candidates are that should be considered, it's all about the money. And I'm not a wealthy Meg Whitman candidate, and I think Jerry Brown demonstrated that all the money in the world doesn't buy you an election. I don't have uh, wealthy family members. I don't have wealthy corporate um, individuals who can write me $5,000 checks. Um, and I think that it's really important that we fight hard for campaign finance reform, to overturn Citizens United, to eliminate corporate personhood, and to really start looking at public financing for campaigns so that the level playing field is established and it can be about the issues, not about who has the most money um, gets the, the press. Um, it's, a, it's a really important issue. Our democracy is at stake with this. I think it, it's important that a candidate actually has some skin in the game in their community, has a, a, a service record, even if it's not an elected office, to be able to demonstrate that they are committed to the community and not just here to win a seat for office. This is, this is my issue, getting money out of politics. This is really, to me, the core issue. We are not going to have Washington, they're the keepers of the hen house, uh, change. The last time that uh, campaign finance came up, Lawrence Lessig in his book, Republic Lost, talked about there were 25 lobbyists running around to keep things, to keep money in politics and keep the backroom deals going for everyone fighting for campaign finance reform. Of course, Citizens United has got to be overturned. Of course, there's got to be a constitutional amendment. Of course, we have to do those things, but they are not going to happen if we keep voting, if we, the voters, keep voting for people that show up with hundreds of thousands and millions of dollars and play by that game. I'm hoping that you people see where I'm coming from, tell 10 people who tell 10 people who tell 10 people, and because it, you're not going to see my ads on the back page of the IJ or in the television. I just am not playing that game. And I think this is what the electorate has to do if we're going to have that fundamental change. Thank you. So I agree that Citizens United has dealt a devastating blow to our democracy. The notion of corporate personhood and unlimited funds flowing into campaigns without proper disclosure is something that will not work. I'm in support of a constitutional amendment to repeal that decision. And the way that we are representing that integrity in our campaign is to renounce all corporate money and corporate PAC money. We are taking only contributions from individuals. And for us, that represents this idea that democracy is about 
uh, representing the people, of the people, by the people, for the people, and only individuals should be supporting campaigns and to the legal limit. We need to have campaign finance reform, we need to have uh, publicly funded campaigns. Uh, until that time, we'll work within the system, but I think everyone up here that you're seeing tonight will be a strong advocate for reform in Congress, and certainly the, t the turn of Citizens United is a fundamental and most um, just one of the most important things we can be doing in terms of getting money out of politics. When Al Gore released his book, Earth and the Balance, he said that the ecology crisis has got to be the central organizing principle for society. Now, he and I both agree it's got to be the climate crisis. Most of the candidates here, though, however, will give you a program as if there isn't a climate crisis, as if, well, we have to take care of it sometime, preferably sooner or later, but there isn't a threshold. Because there is, we have to do something outside of the traditional paradigm. I have a set of proposals called New Green America. There are seven of them, real simple. The climate crisis is national security threat number one. That requires us to get, number two, off of fossil fuels and nuclear as fast as possible and get to a sustained, localized economic structure where we meet our needs as close to home as possible. We have to retreat the American empire and use the military only to defend Americans and their property. And we have to end corporate personhood. We have to end the war on drugs, legalize pot, and we have to prosecute these criminals. These people, the 41 senators, all meet the diagnostic criteria for antisocial personality disorder. I don't know how to heal psychopathy. You have to go in and fight these people and take them down. And that means electoral reform is about finding ways to get corporatists displaced by community leaders, the people in this area that you all go to who have shown you that they really care about you and that they can perform. And I hope to be the first person to invent this way to do it so that you can start doing it with the rest of your elected officials. Well, I certainly share this belief that we've got to overturn Citizens United. What would we say about people who talked about the need for uh, fighting global warming and then drove up with a Hummer? Uh, our campaign is doing more than talking the talk or walking the walk. We're the grassroots leader by far in terms of how to finance a campaign. We, uh, we're the first to announce we won't take any corporate PAC money. Any lobbyist sends us money, we're going to send it right back. We have in the ecology of campaign finance by far the healthiest way. Well over 5,500 different individuals have contributed to our campaign. We have no more now than 1,000 volunteers. We're people powered. Now, I was born at, at night, but not last night. I understand you need money to run a campaign. We've raised hundreds of thousands of dollars in a healthy way, which is to show what we believe in, not just preaching it, but by doing it from individual support the more than 5,000 have given us money are people who believe in what we're doing. They're not fat cats. The next question. What have you done to create jobs in the second district? Great. Thanks for that question. One of the most important things that is right now starting to create jobs and will continue to in the years ahead uh, is supporting the smart rail and trail uh, measure. I'm proud that I was able to co-chair the campaign, both in 06 and in 08, and I'm going to continue to support SMART in Congress, because I want to see it fully built out. I want to see it go all the way from Cloverdale to a seamless connection uh, in Larkspur. Uh, beyond that, I have passed a number of bills that are creating jobs, uh, especially in the area of clean energy, where I've been able to pass the country's largest solar hot water heating program, which is bringing uh, new companies' investments to the state of California. Uh, the world's most ambitious lighting efficiency standards, which is driving all sorts of investment and job creation in this state and around the country. Uh, a number of other initiatives. I'm fighting right now to keep our state parks open because I know, and I think all of you know, how important parks are as economic engines uh, in the North Bay and around the rest of the state. Uh, and I'm continually meeting with and working with our business community. They know me, they support me, and I'm going to continue to represent the entire community to create jobs. Thank you. Uh, one of the first things that I helped to lead in Petaluma was the uh, development of our economic development strategy and to hire an economic development manager uh, who has been tasked with the strategy implementation. That has allowed Petaluma to attract and retain uh, local businesses 
and to fill our vacant spaces. We had quite a bit of commercial vacancy, which we have successfully been able to um, to bring new uh, new employers to from the region. Additionally, on Sonoma County Transportation Authority, I've helped to garner uh, over $238 million in transportation funding for uh, Sonoma County. Uh, these are jobs that are going to be rebuilding our infrastructure and improving our, our trails and, uh, and uh, especially the trail along the rail. I've been a supporter of the Smart Train and um, I'm also working on the Golden Gate uh, Bridge Highway and Transportation District where we have uh, a big uh, project to uh, uh, deal with uh, the old and aging infrastructure of our Golden Gate Bridge. Thank you. I have a long record of helping to create jobs in, in Marin County, um, starting with the Marin Energy Authority, which is start creating some green, clean energy jobs and all, all in retrofits and in energy uh, production, public works programs for our 101 and our walkable, bikeable pathways that we contract out with our um, uh, contractors in the community. I'm working on a Marinwood Village, which is bringing grocery and retail and housing, affordable housing, which is much needed in the community. I'm currently working with George Lucas to bring more than 300 private sector jobs into our community for fi the film industry. And there's a new program that's just been launched in, co in, co in cooperation with the Dominican University called Venture Greenhouse, which is an incubator fast tracking um, those businesses that are working on green and clean um, business programs to help give them what they need the support to build green jobs here in Marin County. To start with, I created uh, a corporation that hired six people, so I, I've started a few jobs here in Marin County, but I think the work that I do in working, um, I have a cutting edge um, drug, drug and alcohol treatment program here in Marin County in Corte Madera, working with adolescents and young adults who have slid into addiction. I've uh, been doing this almost 20 years and I've seen well over a thousand families um, along the way. And I think that, uh, that I may not be out there uh, creating, well actually in a sense I am, I'm keeping them from not having jobs, that's one thing for sure, because they are working. And I'm thinking right now of the dozen uh, young people that, um, that are in months and, and early years of sobriety that are working at serving you uh, your latte at Starbucks or checking you out at Whole Foods. And so um, in my way, I'm doing my part to make sure that people are getting jobs here in the county. So I've had the great pleasure of uh, working in Northern California for over 20 years in the small business, entrepreneurship, and economic development landscape. I'm a Marin business owner. I uh, have a company that does uh, education technology. But I also co-founded the Center for Entrepreneurship and Technology at UC Berkeley, where I have the great privilege of educating young people around entrepreneurship and how to start new business. We have an incubator there that has spun out over 18 companies, all in the Northern California landscape, uh, all now creating jobs, most of them in the clean energy sector. So we do a lot of work with solar and wind, green retrofits, battery technology, all kinds of interesting technology to put us on a sustainable path forward in the clean energy sector, as well as internet technologies and applications and many other exciting areas. So we have put together a plan actually called Making More in America. And I would encourage you all to download it from our website. We're the only campaign with a full legislative agenda around how do we restore our economy, rebuild our middle class, and start to make things in America again, as those are the kinds of high wage jobs that will put our kids through college and make sure we have a secure retirement. I don't think I've created any jobs in the second district. Um, in the 80s, I was a bookstore manager in Berkeley and created three jobs there, that's for sure. I, I work with the poor, though, mostly. I work with the homeless, with veterans, with abused women and children, and I've definitely done a lot to help them find jobs and find work and find homes. Um, when the government fails, what I've done is basically tried to take care of the people who are the victims of that. So four years ago, when the veterans were afraid to let us use their hall for uh, a homeless shelter, I organized a homeless shelter with homeless people in our material community center and created a culture with uh, these women I call church ladies because I'm not particularly religious and they're not particularly radical ecologists. And we created a whole culture. And now I would say about 70% of the people who are homeless there are not homeless. 
I taught them how to use Kama to use our classified ads to look for housing, to look for jobs, to look for all kinds of things. So I basically am a person who takes what we have and tries to solve the problems with that. Let me be clear. I don't believe in trickle-down economics. I don't believe in trickle-down job creation. I reject the myth, whether it comes from Meg Whitman or Mitt Romney or anybody else, that rich people create jobs. Adam Smith had it right. Labor creates all wealth. Wealth does not create labor. As a longtime union activist and union member endorsed by several unions, I believe that it's raising the floor for working people, and I fought for, for instance, uh, the adequate uh, sustainable wage in this county to be maintained for IHSS and home workers. That's how we raise the floor. Let me note, too, that as the only <coughs> candidate in this race with any significant foreign policy experience, the huge elephant and donkey in the living room is close to $3 billion with a B dollars a day spent on the military, which undermines vastly our capacity to create jobs. I believe in a Green New Deal. I've worked for one. Massive public investment is what's needed uh, to get our economy out of the ditch and really create long-lasting employment. Um, Thirty-year history in small business lets me be comfortable that liquidity is a very important thing, and when we as taxpayers give trillions of dollars and that's not made available to the banking institutions, we, you know we've got problems. It's hard to grow jobs if, if we can't grow the businesses that create the jobs. Um, as a psychiatrist, I was trained in lucid dreaming that moved on to an area of in problem solving. Um, I hold over a dozen inventions, some of them with 50 to 60 different inventions per patent. Um, in the area that, of uh, application that's most important is the creation of clean energy. We have clean air, we have clean water, we need clean energy with 600 miles of coast biopower in Australia could be applied, it would generate jobs, it would generate exportable technology um, in both the installation and maintenance. Um, uh, as a physician with 10,000 approvals, I have quite a base of, of popular support as well, and it definitely is a grassroots organization. 